Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 176. This week the questions are taken from guide 228, that's the guide to the Pisa class cruisers of the Italian Navy, and the Wednesday special video on naval engines. Bifi Commander asks, Back in the Scharnhorst video you mentioned they are armed with 11 inch guns because the Germans have lost the ability to make 15 inch weapons. Whilst real life is not like an RTS with always unlocked technology, I'm curious as to exactly what the Germans lacked to make 15 inch weapons. Basically a combination of experience and design expertise, because when they looked at what guns they could manufacture, bearing in mind that when they're deciding what to arm the Scharnhorst with you're talking about the early 1930s, consider what they've got up to that point. The last 15 inch gun that they've made, which would have been for the Baden Bayern class, etc., was made in the early to mid part of World War II, because obviously they had Saxon and Württemberg and plans for a few other ships. Now, by the time you get to the 1930s, you're talking about at least 15, possibly 20 years since, you know, the guys who are in charge of the 15 inch gun project last worked on it those people are almost certainly not working for your company anymore because they would have been fairly senior to be in charge of developing and designing that gun in the first place and they've almost certainly retired. So the original people who worked on it, very, very likely not available. The other problem is that the 15-inch gun that you would equip a 1930s battleship with, and indeed the 15-inch gun that they would equip the Bismarcks with eventually, is a very different weapon from that which was installed on Baden and Bayern. Yes, it's 15 inch, 380 millimeters, technically just a fraction under 15 inch, but who's counting? But that's about where the similarities end. The Bismarck's 15 inch weapon is a far more powerful high velocity weapon compared to the one on Baden and Bayern. So they can't just, you know, pull out the old blueprints and go, yes, we'll, you, you will do that you basically have to design the gun from the ground up again. And as I said, the people who previously had experience with that, not there anymore. Conversely, the Germans had 11-inch guns, and they had expertise in 11-inch guns because 11-inch guns had been what were on the pre-dreadnoughts that they'd been allowed to keep, so they'd obviously kept a certain amount of experience repairing and reconditioning those. They would then also manufactured 11-inch guns for the Deutschlands. Now, granted, those were barely a step above the 11-inch guns that they'd had in World War I, but it meant there was a continuity of effort, and the people who'd worked on the Deutschlands 11-inch guns were almost certainly still around, because that was a lot more proximate to the early 1930s. And so, taking an iterative step to design a better 11-inch gun, something they already knew how to do, in the terms of their recent workforce's experience, was a much safer step than taking that same workforce and saying, right, well, that 11-inch gun you designed, now you've got to make it bigger, it's now going to be a 380mm gun, but also on top of that you've got to make it you know, longer barrel, longer range, higher velocity, etc. Technically it could be done, but it would take a lot longer than just slightly elongating and making better the existing 11-inch weapon, which is a very crude way of saying what they did for the Scharnhorst armament. Um, basically, whenever you iterate on a gun, whether you make it higher velocity or um, if, whether you make it a larger caliber, you are taking a risk. And it was quicker and less risky to just make better 11-inch guns than it was to ask them to develop a brand new high velocity 15-inch weapon basically out of whole cloth. Rolf S. asks, if Amagi hadn't been destroyed by the earthquake, how much might that have changed things for the Japanese Navy? It's almost impossible to say because they did get Kaga, after all. But the one big difference, apart from a slight increase in overall aircraft capacity, would be that the Japanese would have a pair of similar carriers, obviously Amagi and Akagi, rather than two dissimilar ones. But, you know, the conversions and reconversions and refits, etc., that had all been done would all still have been done by World War Two, which, as I say, leaves you effectively with, okay, we have slightly more aircraft on 
one of our fleet carriers. But also, and this is pretty much where the major change, if anything, comes in, all of the Kedopatai's carriers are now capable of high speed because cargo was very much the albatross around their necks, only being able to do 28 knots, which means they can move a little bit faster. Now, how does that actually help them? Potentially, not by all that much. I mean, their cruising around is still going to be done at cruising speeds, so that's not going to change all that much. But where you might, and I stress might, see some difference more along the lines of, you know, butterfly wings flap, is that when it comes to specific circumstances, like, say, the Battle of Midway, where the Japanese fleet is in the exact location that it is, obviously having conducted fly tops at speed, because in part cargo is limited, so they can only go places as, as a fleet at a certain speed, well, maybe if it, there's... Amagi instead of Kaga, maybe they would have been traveling a few knots faster, and therefore maybe they're going to be in a slightly different location when the American aircraft show up. And if they're in a slightly different location, then the American aircraft maybe don't meet up in exactly the same way that they do, and maybe the interceptions go a lot better for the Japanese pilots, or maybe they go a lot worse, who knows? So, you know, it could have had a fairly major effect on the Battle of Midway, it could have had virtually no effect on the Battle of Midway, Unfortunately, it's just, it's so small a change that it's fundamentally not going to make all that much of a difference. I mean, I suppose at Pearl Harbor, there'll be a handful more aircraft in the air, so there's a, a slight chance that something additional might get catastrophically bombed or torpedoed. But again, these differences are relatively minor. Eduardo Charlier asks, in regards to the Nagato class, how powerful really were they? Which ships or classes were they superior to, and which ones would reliably outclass them before and after the refits? So with the Nagatos, it is a little bit difficult to quantify exactly where they sit, because compared to the ships that you might regard as their immediate contemporaries, the Nelsons and the Colorados, the Nagatos are considerably faster than both. Then when you look at ships that are, say, a generation behind, well, at that point you're basically looking at Queen Elizabeth or Revenge, or, you know, Tennessee, California, and the New Mexicos. So, when, but when it comes to those, I think with the prior generation ships, even though the Tennessees are very much almost Colorado's just with triple 14s the standards you can say well actually they're about five knots slower than a Nagato as originally built and they have 14 inch guns albeit more of them versus 16 inch guns with the revenges again slower slightly smaller guns with QEs you could probably make a reasonably decent comparison because they're not that I mean the Nagatos are still faster than them but they're not as much faster as they are compared to almost everything else. So let's say QEs, Nelsons, and Colorados are our comparison points. Now, as we said, Nagato is already still faster than all of them, much faster than the Colorados, a bit faster than the Nelsons, and fractionally faster than the QEs. So in that respect, pretty good. They can dictate the range for the most part against everything except maybe a QE that's really pushing it. Uh, it'll still have a speed advantage, but maybe not enough of one to fully dictate how the range is going but then you get to the firepower now the firepower eight 16 inch guns eight 16 inch guns nine 16 inch guns eight 15 inch guns it's all much of a muchness to be perfectly honest armor penetration values for the nagato's guns aren't fantastic but they're not fantastic for a 16-inch gun. It is still a 16-inch weapon. It, has, it packs quite the punch. So you can kind of take it or leave it in terms of overall firepower when you're comparing it to some of the other ships that they're potentially being compared against. The biggest problem is armor. The Nagatos, in part, by their speed 
at the expense of protection. They're protected by a 12-inch belt. That would have been all right when you're facing 12-inch guns. It might have been all right-ish if a little on the thin side when you're facing 13.5 or 14-inch guns. When you're facing 15 and 16-inch guns, at least assuming the shells are working properly, it's really not adequate. And I think that is where they really fall down. Because, yes, they can dictate the range, but especially in their as-built configurations, you're not really going to be fighting much beyond 20,000 yards, maybe a fraction more. And you're going to be trying to close down the range further still. And even post-refit considerations when maybe engagements are happening at the mid-20s of thousands of yards. Well, with their guns against the armour of either 13-inch armour of the QEs, 13.5-inch of the Colorados, or the um, inclined, much thicker armour belt of the Nelsons, Nagato's guns, assuming a broadside engagement, so obviously take that with what you will with terms of angles, etc., but assuming a broadside engagement, Nagato's guns need to be around about 15,000 yards, give or take a few thousand yards, depending on the specific armour scheme, quite a few in the case of the Nelsons, to penetrate the Citadel. Now, obviously, you can still smash up lots of other stuff outside the Citadel with 16-inch gunfire much beyond that range, and that may well buy you a battle-winning advantage, but above that range, so well into the sort of high teens and low 20,000s of realistic battle gate engagement ranges, the citadels of the ships you'd most directly compare a Nagato to are effectively immune to its shells, assuming that everything performs up to spec. That's not the case for Nagato. Um, the 15-inch 42 can, at least by the 1930s, just about penetrate Nagato's belt at around about 20,000 yards. Nelson's 16-inch guns can. Colorado's 16-inch guns definitely can. Um, and so that kind of gives an approximately five to 6,000-yard range bracket, which is well within the capabilities of both sides to hit each other, where Nagato cannot hurt the citadel of its opponents, its contemporary opponents, but its contemporary opponents can very much hurt it. And obviously, if both sides are angled, then that range bracket moves. But it still exists. So, I'm... The, the problem is that, yes, they have the speed. But all they can really do with that speed is hold an engagement to a point where both sides can't hurt each other's citadels, which is going to be a fairly long-distance engagement, assuming that you don't get deck penetrations at which point you're basically chancing your arm on a relatively low number of hits and then hoping that one of those will destroy or cripple the enemy's ability to, you know, use central direct firing enough so that you can then close what's now going to be a considerable distance into a point where your guns can actually hurt your opponent if you're in command of the Nagato. Um, or you have to close through this danger space very quickly. So it doesn't mean that Nagato couldn't win a fight against those three contemporary or semi-contemporary vessels, but it's going to be a bit of an uphill struggle to do so. So although Nagato, you could probably say, argue, reliably outclasses the generation that came before her, which is uh, fair enough, what you're intending her to do, with the exception possibly there of the QEs, once you get to contemporary vessels, it's it's arguable that Nagato probably represents the least capable of the three immediate pre-treaty war, uh, capital ship designs. Its speed gives it a certain combat utility. It can move around faster, it can go places, it can even tangentially possibly try and keep up with carrier forces, which, to be fair, the Nelsons and the Colorados can't do unless the carriers are scaling themselves well back. But in a direct fight, it is half a rung below the other two. KD asks, Hey Drac, long-time subscriber. I was watching videos about the World War II camp liberators, and I came across one in particular that involves a naval question regarding a soldier named Leo Hymas. 
Uh, in the video, he talks about his transatlantic journey on the troop ship the Brazil in December 44 to January 45. He says that a U-boat fired a torpedo at the convoy and a destroyer captain ordered his ship to steer into its path and took the hit to prevent any troop ship from being sunk. I haven't been able to find any information about this incident. Could you help? So I did a bit of digging and I found the Brazil, which was an ocean liner pre-war, was definitely serving as a troop ship and definitely did make a couple of transatlantic crossings as a troop ship in for, uh, late 44 and early 45. However, um, for the time period covered by December 44 to January 45, she appears in the records of four convoys. CU-48, which left New York on the 23rd of November 1944, arrives in Liverpool on the 5th of December, and then UC-48A, which leaves Liverpool on the 8th three days later and arrives back in New York on the 22nd of December, then CU-53, which leaves on the 3rd of January 45, arriving in Liverpool on the 14th of January, and then UC-53A, which leaves on the 19th of January and arrives back in New York on the 2nd of February. So, given that the Obviously, on the UC voyages, their return voyages, he's unlikely to be on those, which means that if he was on the Brazil in either December 44 or January 45, he was either in CU 48 or CU 53. But I can't find any records of any of the ships in CU 48 or CU 53 um, being lost uh, on that convoy route. And I can't, I also can't find any allied losses in late 44 early 45 that would correspond to that the i managed to find three losses to u-boats in that period um hms bullen was sunk by u775 hmcs uh and I apologize to our canadian listeners cleocut i think was sunk by uh, uh, u8 Zero six, and she was escorting a convoy, but that convoy was XB-139. And then HMS Kappel was sunk by U-486. Now, Kappel and Bullen were both part of escort groups. It's not entirely clear immediately what convoys they were escorting or if they were just on general hunting duty. Um, Claycutt was with a convoy, but as I say, it was not with either of the convoys that Brazil was part of. So from the evidence that seems to be available, it doesn't seem like that uh, story happened, at least in the time period specified. Now, the reason I would say that is that the Brazil was quite the frequent troop ship in this time period. Um, I mean, she was serving throughout the war, but specifically in late 44 and early 45, you will find that, as well as serving in a, a bunch of other convoys, specifically in the CU troop convoys, um, she was also in CU-35 and C CU-39 and CU-44, which were August, September and October 94 sailings, and CU-57 and CU-62, which sailed in February 45 and March 45. Now, on any of those it's entirely possible that perhaps that particular incident did occur but within the time period specified um i can't i can't find any evidence for it happening so i would suggest perhaps that the we could expand out the search parameters and see if any of those ships any of those convoys correspond to that kind of incident an Audible Sabre asks, were there any considerations towards making sternwheel paddle warships as opposed to sidewheel? Uh, such ships were common riverine warships in the American Civil War, and it does solve the problem of broadside space. It does, and here's one uh, for everyone's viewing pleasure. But there are two major problems, and one minor one, when it comes to sternwheel ocean-going warships, as opposed to river warships, which, as you point out, was definitely a thing. The minor issue is that if you get raked astern, you're in a lot of trouble. I mean, if a sailing ship gets raked fore or aft, you're in a lot of trouble. But if that happens to a ship with a stern paddle wheel, well, your entire method of propulsion just got smashed to pieces, as well as, you know, the fact there's several tons of cannon shock 
raking your length, which is never a good thing. The two larger issues, however, are one, stern wheel paddle ships are somewhat notoriously difficult to steer, which is not too much of a problem if you're going at low speed maneuvers in a sh relatively shallow draft vessel in a river. But if you're at sea where you're supposed to be sta able to do station keeping, uh, staying in a line and maneuvering around fairly hostile coasts, etc., that can be a very major problem. So that's one big issue against it. The other major problem that um, goes against using uh, stern wheel ships in the ocean is the ocean itself, the weather, because a ship will pitch and roll as it runs. Now, rolling was already something of a problem for paddle steamers because you could end up with one paddle out of the water and the other one in, but um, as long as the two paddle wheels were linked together on a single shaft or linked in some manner, you didn't have too much of a problem with one wheel racing out of control because obviously the other wheel would be fairly heavily embedded in the water and thus the overall rotation speed would be kept down. Where the two paddles did operate on completely different shafts, severe rolling such that the paddle could mostly or entirely clear the water was a problem in terms of making the engine race out of control. But with a stern wheel vessel, um, quite apart from the fact that, you know, the sheer size of a stern wheel that you'd need for a several thousand ton ship would be an interesting challenge. Um, but that aside... Um, in a severe storm, if the ship pitches downwards, i.e. bow first, which it's going to be doing a lot, there's a fairly high chance that the stern wheel will be lifted bodily mostly or entirely out of the water, at which point it's going to race out of control and potentially severely damage itself on re-entry into the water. In really bad storms, this can even happen with a ship's screws, and that can be quite dangerous, but a stern paddle wheel would be much more vulnerable to that. And so as a result, adding up all these potential issues together, you end up not really seeing any um, stern wheel warships on the open seas. Federico del Sarto asks, what do you think about the Italian MAS boats? Now, I should <laughs> mention that the original question just says the Italian Mars, or MAS, which is not entirely helpful because... And apologies to Italian listeners if I mess this up, but MARS or MAS stands for Moto Scarfo Amato Silurante, which is torpedo on motorboat. <laughs> that can refer to a couple of things. The obvious one, the MARS boats, or it can also refer to um, 10th Flotilla, who are kind of, were the kind of Italian naval special forces, which involve a much larger array of equipment rather than just the motor torpedo boats it also involves things like the um, underwater man torpedo uh, sabotage equipment um, the semi-remote controlled kamikaze boats that sank hms york and things like that so for the sake of an easier life i've decided to interpret it as the mas the actual torpedo boats themselves rather than the unit which i've done a video or two on um now in terms of the italian motor torpedo boats as you can see they're pretty small little things um eventually would be phased out in the second world war towards the end of the second world war on the basis of being a bit too small and not able to take care of themselves but they actually have a fairly long history going way back into the first world war and whilst there were some attempted offensive uses of small motor torpedo boats in the first world war and immediately thereafter um the british coastal motor, motor torpedo boats being used in the short conflict with the soviet union in 1919 for example the italians seem to have made themselves past masters at this particular employment because you've got pt boats in the us you've got mtbs in the uk you've got s boats in germany and whilst they do, all of those do have a certain amount of success operating against large units, the ones that seem to have the most consistent ongoing success against military targets seem to be the Italian mass boats. They bag themselves a couple of battleships in 
World War One, uh, one pre dreadnought, one dreadnought, as well as a bunch of uh, smaller stuff. They're also used in anti sub hunting gear work. And although they don't manage to quite destroy as big and impressive targets as a couple of battleships when it comes to World War Two, they are able to damage or sink quite a number of smaller vessels from cruisers, destroyers, merchant ships, etc. So overall, I would rate them pretty highly. I mean, for the amount of investment that's put into them, the returns in terms of enemy ships uh, destroyed and damaged are certainly very, very high. Uh, and they certainly seem to have a kind of a per ton success rate that is, at least against warships, significantly higher unsupported than you seem to get with almost everybody else's motorized torpedo boats. BK Jong asks, considering Germany's geographical position, would the Kriegsmarine having better designs in World War II have helped them much in the grand scheme of things, or would it lead to ships not being able to get out nearly all the time anyway? Well, it certainly wouldn't have hurt. I mean, yeah, you have a point. No matter what the Kriegsmarine do, realistically, given the amount of resources they have and the naval infrastructure that Germany has, just making the ships that they have better isn't going to win them the war. That's for certain. But it might help a little bit um, in as much as, you know, if you can you know, design a relatively efficient Bismarck design, shave a few thousand tons off of there, well, that's a few thousand tons of high-quality steel that could be going into other things like tanks or U-boats or destroyers and so on and so forth. Um, and having a half-decent set of light cruisers would actually mean their light cruiser force could do something. This was one of the major problems with the German idea of surface raiding, because the, the surface raiding, even by warships at least, rather than the Hilfskreuzer, even if it didn't usually accomplish all that much, certainly in sort of efficiency per tonne compared to U-boats, in terms of ships sunk, it did disrupt Allied convoy efforts and cause an awful lot of kerfuffle with warships trying to track down the surface raiders. So it was quite good at disrupting Allied efforts. The big problem that the Germans had was that one, something like the Scharnhorsts or a Bismarck was such a major threat that it attracted an awful lot of attention very quickly, um, which the raiding voyages by, okay, the Deutschlands kind of attracted that attention. Um, Graf Spee certainly did, albeit you can probably argue that's because it was very early on and you know, the Allies were only fighting one navy and they had both the British and French navy around, so they had a lot of resources to throw out a very small number of threats. But... Um, when you look at the breakouts by Deutschland and Scheer, they don't attract anywhere like the level of attention in terms of warship searching for them that the Scharnhorst do in Operation Berlin or Bismarck does in Rheinabung. But even when you consider the sort of the Deutschlands and the Hippers, once Graf Spee is out of the way, you've got Deutschland, later Lutzau, and Scheer. So you've got two of them. And with the Hippers, well, <laughs> initially you have... Hipper and Blucher. Blucher doesn't last too long because that name is cursed in German service. And you then have eventually Hipper and Prince Eugen. Uh, but that's still only two ships. And when you add up with the Deutschlands four, there's a number of other demands on Kriegsmarine ship duties that means they can't really maintain a regular output of surface raiders. And certainly they can't re uh, send out a lot of surface raiders early on when perhaps their effectiveness would have been maximised because some of them, like Prince Eugen, just aren't ready yet. So given that you can get more light cruisers um, and they're going to attract even less overwhelming firepower, although obviously they are more at risk from heavy convoy escorts like Allied light cruisers and heavy cruisers, I'd argue that if you had, say, all the German light cruisers replaced on a like-for-like -like basis with something that might actually survive a transatlantic voyage once in a while and get them out there, you could cause a lot more disruption to Allied lines, especially if you send out, you know, a Deutschland, say, and two or three of the of your theoretical Königsberg replacements, because then you've got, let's say, four surface warships out there hunting uh, allied convoys 
And the Allies don't necessarily know which one is the Deutschland class. You know, it could be the one that's headed for the west coast of the States. It could be the one that's in the North Atlantic. It could be the one that's in the South Atlantic. It could be the one that's prowling near the entrance to the Mediterranean. And that means you've got to put together enough forces to deal with a Deutschland class threat in every single possible location. That is going to stretch Allied resources a lot. And if you can pull off a similar trick with, say, something around about the time of Operation Berlin, i.e., during the period when it's just the Royal Navy and they're having to wonder about the Italians and the Germans at the same time, that could have a hugely disruptive effect, especially if you send out a Scharnhorst or two or a Bismarck and a small flotilla of light cruisers. Because, again, now you have to think about, okay, well, there's a battleship out there. We need to have forces out there that can at least see off a battleship. But there's four or five potential German targets out there operating in different areas. We've now got to have overwhelming force in all of those areas. Do we actually have that? Because only the commitments in the Mediterranean? Probably not. Um, so then you have to start to prioritise. But if you start to prioritise, then you're leaving areas vulnerable, which means that, well, best case scenario for the Allies, you have a light cruiser running rampant for a while or two. Um, worst case scenario, they guess wrong, Um Perhaps that ends very badly for one of the light cruisers. Maybe Renown shows up and hammers one. But on the other hand, you know, there may be a Scharnhorst floating around out there going, where did all the warships go? I don't know. Oh, well, here's a convoy. Time to kill it. So eventually, they, especially once the US gets involved, they're going to get boxed in. They're going to get gradually attritioned away. Yes, it's not going to win them the war. Fully acknowledge that. But I think better, more efficient designs would have allowed them to cause more havoc, even assuming they had the same number of ships in the same classes. And by having more efficient designs specifically, there's a lot of steel that could have gone into other things. Clement Brurera asks, How do you rate the Duca degli Abruzzi light cruiser compared to its contemporaries? It seems a fairly balanced ship with good protection and good armament. The Abruzzi's, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the full name, because otherwise, given how many Italian names I've no doubt mangled in <laughs> this video, I will have a vendetta against me. Um, anyway, the Abruzzi's, they are pretty decent, I would say, compared to other similar vessels in of around their time. It is a little bit difficult to quantify them, because... They, whereas, well, okay, fair enough, the Japanese kind of lied about everything, but the Japanese don't have any contemporary actual light cruiser designs for this period to compare them against. There's the Megamis, but one, the Megamis are overweight, two, they're actually heavy cruisers in disguise, so we'll ignore them. Um, but, well, the Germans only have one type of light cruiser, and yes, the Abruzzi beats the Königsberg six ways from Sunday, and yes, the Königsberg is my eternal punching bag. If I ever have an actual punching bag, I will name it Königsberg. Um, so, well, that's a low bar to clear, but it cleared in fairly spectacular style. Um, now, other than that, the real competitors are the Towns and the Brooklyns. In some ways, it's going to be a little bit of an unfair comparison because the Abruzzi's are well over 11,000 tons standard displacement. So they are cheating a little bit by being sort of 12, 13% above the treaty weight limits. Whereas the towns and Brooklyn's did do an awful lot to try and fit into those weight limits. Now, apart from that... Armament-wise, 10 6-inch guns, okay, it's not the 15 in guns of the Brooklyns, it's not the 12 guns of the Towns. Um, I would say it's, it's probably... It, it puts them within shouting distance of the Towns. Yes, you've got two less guns, yeah, the rate of fire isn't absolutely brilliant, but it you're not... You're disadvantaged compared to a Towns firepower output, but not, not critically. Um... Compared to a Brooklyn class, on the other hand, um, yeah, you're, you're in a bit of trouble. <laughs> the, a Brooklyn, fifteen guns, and with an incredibly high rate of fire. I'm, I'm not, I'm not putting any money on 
the Abruzzis at that point. Speed-wise, though, they're pretty nippy. They're the fastest of the three ships we're looking at, so they've got that going for them. Armour is an interesting one, because the, this kind of is the Abruzzis trump card to a certain degree. It's actually got a fairly heavy armour scheme, especially for a light cruiser. So it's got just a fraction under 4 inches, 3.9 inch inner belt, which is kind of dished in, so it's concave, and it has an outer belt that's 30 millimetres, 1.2 inches. Um, and that's really the thing that's going to be most in play here, because let's face it, 6 inch cruiser is not really going to engage in plunging fire through deck um, battles. Now, how does that compare to the two competitors we're talking about? Well, the turrets are similarly quite well protected, but the Brooklyn, for example, has a slightly thicker overall belt um, when it comes to being at the machinery spaces. In actual numerical terms, the a Bruzy's belt is actually thicker still because the Brooklyn has five inches over the machinery, but then two inches over the magazines. The Abruzzi's just 3.9 inches all the way through with your 30 mil over the top. So collectively, that actually gives 5.1, which makes it technically slightly better armoured, but it is spaced armour. So if the spacing works to a certain degree, and it will work against lighter calibre gunfire like destroyers and even against 6-inch gunfire from competitive cruisers, it might work depending on the angles, then the Abruzzi is theoretically slightly better protected than the Brooklyn. In it's just a straight-up contest of metal, the Brooklyn has better protection over the machinery but not as good protection over the magazines. Um, and the town, um, on the other hand, obviously... It depends a little bit on which particular town subclass you're looking at, but assuming we're looking at the most common one, excluding the Edinburgh subclass, which is, of course, Belfast and Edinburgh, the Abruzzis are somewhat to relatively considerably better armoured than the towns. The Edinburghs specifically are better protected than the Abruzzis, I would argue, but there's only two of them out of a total build run of uh, ten. So the Abruzzis, in a lot of ways, are kind of some of, if not the best, armoured light cruisers. And I guess that's part of the reason, as well as perhaps their speed, why they only have the 10 guns. So excluding the Edinburghs, if you put the Abruzzis in a straight-up fight with a town class, I'd kind of just go 50-50. Um, it's going to depend largely on who basically who manages to get the, de the good hits in first but the Abruzzis certainly have a decent amount of protection against the town class gunnery um, at least for the vitals the town class have slightly more guns slightly higher rate of fire so there's a chance they might hit something that's going to really mess up the Abruzzis day anyway and that chance is a little bit higher than vice versa but broadly speaking it's a it's a pretty good solid matchup um and, you know, which one's going to take the advantage is kind of take as you will, depending on which one you favour in the first place, I guess. Um, against the Brooklyns, the Abruzzi is going to be, again, potentially, could quite conceivably beat a Brooklyn, but it's a much wider gap. Um, effectively, it's going to come down to the Brooklyn has the gunnery advantage. It's got more gu a lot more guns it's firing a lot quicker um it can really mess up the upper works of the abruzzi which will then make the abruzzi unable to really return fire effectively but if the brooklyn's captain gets the range such that he starts pounding in on the abruzzi's hull and going after its vitals instead of its upper works the abruzzi can actually tank that long enough i think for its own guns to come back in and potentially do enough damage to the Brooklyns, especially given the relatively weak magazine protection, to win the fight. However, it is kind of the Brooklyns' fight to lose, because if even part of the Brooklyns' ridiculous firepower starts spraying down the Abruzzi's upper works, 10 guns with a much lower rate of fire is not going to beat 15 guns with an insane rate of fire. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say the Abruzzi's are fairly balanced. 
the only thing that I would suggest could be improved would be be if you're not going to give them four triples for 12 guns then maybe make their rate of fire on those guns a bit more competitive with the towns and maybe within shouting distance of the brooklands but other than that they're a pretty decent ship they're a little bit overweight compared to the other two but that protection scheme is actually quite good so i wouldn't necessarily say it's it doesn't de definitely isn't the top cruiser but it's certainly very, very competitive, which is a lot more than you can say for the Königsbergs or the Japanese failure to even try. Ger Variola asks, I was surprised when I learned how relatively little explosive compound a battleship's high explosive shell usually contains in comparison to the corresponding armor piercing shell, and even more surprising in relation to the shell's total mass. I mean, biggest boom for the buck is what high explosive is about, isn't it? Is it possible to increase the amount of explosives, let's say half or maybe even more of a given shell's mass, or if not, why not? Well, I mean, it's understandable when you look at high explosive shells for, say, 15, 16-inch guns, you're talking about a shell that's typically 1,700 to 1,900 pounds in weight, but of that, only about 150 to 250 pounds of that is explosive, which, you know, okay... 150 to 250 pounds of explosive still not something to really laugh at but when the shell overall weighs 10 times that amount much you maybe begin to question what's going on especially when you look at the cross section of a high explosive shell like this one i oh, admittedly this is a relatively small one and you think well, that's a lot of explosive by volume well it comes down to two things one the shell still has to survive the shock of the charge going off and the force of the acceleration and the force of the deceleration at least long enough for it to a explode on the target and b not explode in the gun barrel so there are going to be limits as to how much of the shell's volume you can make out of explosive the other part is simply the fact that explosive isn't actually that dense compared to metal <laughs> metal is is fairly dense so Whilst you might have a shell that by volume is more than 50% explosive, the weight of that is actually going to be relatively low. Whereas, say with this one or any number of other high explosive type shells, the actual volume of metal in that shell might be considerably less than proportionally than of the explosive amount but it's still going to weigh an awful lot more simply just due to the different density. I mean, most explosives have a density somewhere in the region of about one to one and a half tons per cubic meter. Steel has a density somewhere in the region of seven and a half to eight tons a cubic meter. Um, so it takes a lot less steel to come up with a lot more weight. And that's why, despite the fact that a, okay, slight shaping on the nose aside, a high explosive shell and an armor piercing shell are going to have to be for the same gun be about the same size and therefore about the same volume high explosive shells themselves usually weigh considerably less than an armor piercing shell i mean the um armor piercing shell on an iowa's guns for example is 2700 pounds um but the high explosive shell despite being as a roughly volumetrically the same is only about 1900 pounds and that's because you've carved out an awful lot of weight that would otherwise be metal and replaced it with a comparatively lightweight amount of explosive. So, unfortunately, you can't get tremendously more weight of explosive in a high explosive shell because, to be honest, even if you fashioned a high explosive shell purely from some kind of relatively solid explosive uh, compound, it's going to weigh practically nothing compared to a steel-bodied armor-piercing shell. Andre Gardner asks, what class of ship is the SA-80 of the naval world? Well, in terms of initial form, breaks a lot, generally unloved, later rebuilt to be somewhat useful, well, the Courageous class pretty much fit that definition to a T. <laughs> As in and of themselves, I mean, what they were supposed to be used for is one thing. What they ended up being used for is another thing entirely. But even setting that aside, they were far too lightly built for their own good. Um, so, yeah, they 
broke a lot. They broke themselves a lot. Um, and then eventually, after everybody had decided they pretty much hated them, got turned into actually some somewhat useful aircraft carriers. So that is basically the SAAT story, except in ship form rather than gun form. You could probably also argue, to a certain extent, um, HMS Repulse and Renown, uh, nicknamed Refit and Repair at one point in their original as-launched formats. Yeah, I would hesitate to take them out against anything in particular that had any substantial amount of firepower, but once they'd been refitted with additional armour, and especially with Renown once she'd been modernised, actually made a pretty darn useful fast capital ship. Patrick Donnelly asks... Did the Japanese Navy consider night carrier operations at any time prior to and during World War II? They don't appear to have considered carrier night operations particularly with any great degree of seriousness. They're experiments here and there, but nothing on a large-scale formalised basis. And once World War II begins, well... They run out of experienced carrier air crew relatively speaking quickly so by the time that you see the u.s navy for example beginning to really bring in night carrier ops the japanese have more problems <laughs> to deal with like you know getting ex air sort of relatively trained carrier pilots out there or getting carrier pilots out there period um, and getting them aircraft rather than you know worrying about an increasing increasing the level of difficulty with trying to develop a night fighting dock doctrine i'm pretty sure if the japanese carrier force wasn't under such immense pressure by late 43 early 44 they probably would have but you know circumstances dictated that wasn't going to happen this should be drawn distinctly from japanese navy night aircraft operations because you've got to remember the japanese navy had a lot of land-based aircraft as well and those did conduct night operations quite extensively almost right from the beginning of the war but in terms of Operating from a moving flight deck on a carrier, not so much. Minion asks, We all appreciate your work and the content you provide, but the elephant in the room is why you and your wonderful partner, Mrs. Drack, a.k.a. the affectionate sea mine, got here. Basically, why did you start the channel? Well, it's a tale I've told on some one or two live streams, I think, and I've certainly told a number of people in person, so you yeah, might as well all know about it. So... Way back at the uh, beginning of the channel, uh, sort of 2015, 2016-ish, well, at least this is kind of the time period that I was thinking about starting it uh, and ended up doing so, I was working for Transport for London. For those of you who aren't aware, they are based, shockingly enough, in central London, and I am not, thankfully. So that meant an hour to an hour and a half commute on a train, which in London means you are basically reenacting a sardine in a can twice a day. So you're not going to be reading anything. Uh, you're not even strictly going to be watching all that much. But you can listen to stuff. And it does get very boring. So I decided I was going to listen to music. But there's only so much music you can listen to with, you know, two to three hours of commuting all each day, every day, Four months at a time before it all starts to sound a bit repetitive and annoying so i had at the what well, at the time was a relatively rare thing an unlimited data plan on my phone and i thought aha i can watch youtube videos or at least listen to them um that will be interesting but there i mean there were a bunch of stuff that i used to listen to um good old total biscuit before he sadly passed um but one of the things I really wanted to listen to was stuff about naval history, because, you know, shockingly enough, I'm interested in this stuff. And what I found, at least circa 2016, was that, uh, to put it my, well, to put it bluntly, the channels I found covering naval history either had tried and given up and were dead, or else, and I'm sorry, the one or two to whom this applies for that time period, the voices basically were the next best thing to drag your nails down a chalkboard and were effectively unlistenable to. Um, I suppose maybe there's four categories. Then there was, well, actually no. So those are two categories. And then there was a third category, which was actually well presented, listenable, very accurate information, spot on what I was looking for. Um, you've got then the colliery, 
of with the uh, first two of whether or not the information they were presenting was accurate or not um, and a lot of them weren't um, but of the ones that did unfortunately as I said the, they were either dead channels or the person in question did not have naval history as the primary focus of their channel which meant that they would put out a good video but they might only put out a good video on naval history specifically maybe once a month maybe a couple times a month and say if you've got three hours to kill every day well you're gonna be really waiting for that next video um so i was stuck there going right well there is nobody at this point who's putting out accurate well-researched regular naval history content i guess i'll have to do it myself then won't i um, which was something of a paradox because it meant I still didn't have anything to listen to on my long commutes, but now somebody else did, uh, which was, I guess, something. Um, and the, that's kind of how the channel kicked off and grew from there. Um, so, yeah, if, if, if there had been someone doing something similar to what I'm doing now, at the time then... I probably wouldn't have bothered. I'd just be a happy subscriber. Um, and as I say, you know, there are channels out there who were out there back then and are still around now, like Military History Visualized, for example, who are doing really good naval history stuff. Um, it's just that it's obviously not the primary focus of, of Bernard's channel, so um, it's just not as often. Jack Devaney asks... In an earlier dry dock, you mentioned that a rule of thumb for navies to upgun their battleships, unless it's pre-World War in Germany, is the calibre has to go up by at least 1.5 inches. So my question is this. The Royal Navy, instead of going for the 13.5 inch gun they historically did, instead go for a 14 inch gun. Whether they make a Vickers salesman really happy or they make their own doesn't really matter. If that did happen, would the Queen Elizabeth still have 15 inch guns or would we see a slightly bigger, meaner version of them with 15.5 or even 16 inch guns? Well, yeah, if they go with 14 inch guns, then yeah, the gap between a 14 and a 15 inch in terms of overall firepower is not as significant as the gap between a 13.5 and a 15. And therefore the additional weight bearing in mind that on approximately the same displacement as a Queen Elizabeth, you can get 10 to 12 14-inch guns, depending on, uh, I guess, if you're going to downrate the propulsion or not. Um, so, therefore, indiv individually more guns adding up to probably a greater broadside weight, despite the individual guns of the 15-inch firing a heavier shell. So, yeah, I think at that point, they wouldn't go for the 15. If they've gone from 12 to 14 inch, then they're going to have to go for at least 15.5, probably 16. Um, and, I mean, you can actually see that historically, because when you consider the Royal Navy's progression, 12 to 13.5 to 15, hit in real life, obviously, their next progression is to 16, which seems to break that rule, but... When you look at what they were developing for the G3s and N3s, actually the next jump from the 15 was the 18-inch weapon. And when they figured out they couldn't fit an 18-inch on their desired battle cruiser without completely having to rework most of their dry docks, what was their next step down? It was a 16.5. Then it turned out you couldn't get the 16.5 on the battle cruisers either, and they had to go down to 16. But their immediate fallback position if they didn't have an 18 was a 16.5 now in terms of your theoretical queen elizabeth here i don't think they would have done gone for a 15.5 in part because the larger the gun you get the um you actually start getting a lot more bang for your buck by edging out a little bit further um, the sort of return on investment isn't quite as great um, for going up by 1.5 inches once you hit over the mid-teens. Um, and then also, you know, if you've gone up by two inches previously, you might as well go up by another two inches. And the Royal Navy, okay, 
I was going to say they like round numbers. The 13.5 inch shows that they blatantly don't in this particular case, but where possible, they kind of do. So um, at that point, yeah, I think if you've got the Orion's King George V's and Iron Dukes armed with 14 inch guns, probably still 10 in twin turrets, then to get that additional firepower advantage, I think the Queen Elizabeths are probably going to be eight 16 inch guns. Which in turn means they're either going to have to be slightly slower or they're going to have to be slightly bigger. Which is going to make a lot of people in the Treasury very sad. Kevin Kennelly asks, The Industrial Revolution, post-American Civil War through to World War II, drove the evolution of naval technology in many fields. Smelting and refining, metallurgy, chemical, petrochemical engineering, optics, communications and electronics. What were the milestones in these fields that led to naval innovations? Oh, there are quite a lot. Um, obviously nowhere near enough time in a dry duck answer to name all of them, but some of the more notable ones that I would pick out would be, for example, the advances in steel making. So the invention of the Bessemer process and then the French picking up and running away with the ball by quite considerable margin um, in the 1870s and then into the 1880s. That made a huge difference because up until then it was basically iron, 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 iron for armour and guns. Um, they could make steel shot, but it was not exactly the world's highest output industry. Once the Bessemer process got going, though, it wasn't very long before you could start getting steel guns, refined versions of steel shot, and of course steel armour. Steel armour didn't necessarily work out for the best initially, but it was very quickly adapted into compound armour, which allowed for armour effectiveness to go up, even if thickness did not, and then obviously later on would lead to Harvey Steel and Krupp Steel. So that kind of 1870s steel making milestone is very, very important for naval innovations. Um, then you've got oil extraction, much as that probably gets quite a lot of beating over the head these days, the development of a large-scale oil extraction and oil refining techniques in the early 20th century, as well as you know, actually finding sources of the stuff, was a huge step for naval engineering because it meant that you could now have oil-fired ships, um, which vastly decreased the amount of time you needed to refuel a vessel. It made refueling a vessel a lot safer, it also actually led to some interesting changes in the way armour was laid out because oil could not be used the way that coal had been as a kind of stand-in-ish for armour in bunkers. Um, and it obviously had very different properties as well. It changed the response level of engines. It changed the power density of engines. So, yeah, the the industrial innovations that led to the widespread availability of oil were led to a huge change in the capabilities of naval vessels the radio radio communications and electronics that's kind of a bit of a slower burn one because obviously naval radio existed as a thing for a considerable amount of time before it became absolutely indispensable but eventually it would, because if it wasn't for the invention of radio, you wouldn't eventually get the invention of radar. And obviously the invention of radar in the late 30s, and then it's compacting and mounting on ships in the 40s, was a huge, huge naval innovation, because it eliminated the weather to a certain extent as a restriction on the ship's ability to see where it was going and see where the enemy was. Also provided a lot of very accurate data once you'd refined the technology which led to its eventual overtaking of the optical uh, rangefinder and fire control methods. Um, whilst radio was a useful way of communicating with ships in the First World War, I think if you took all sides in balance, you could probably argue that radio was probably actually slightly detrimental in the First World War, because whilst the Royal Navy could and did make fairly decent use of radio to a certain degree, um, they probably could have gotten along with the telegraph system and the more usual ways of signalling without... I mean, it would obviously affect negatively their overall capabilities, but it might not 
massively impact them, whereas Room 40 <laughs> and its constant deciphering of German radio communications, combined with the Germans' love of the new technology, yeah, that, that, I suspect the High Seas Fleet, once they learned about that, would probably have much rather done without radio entirely than have the British reading practically everything they ever said. And finally for this week, Sinar asks, In the age of sail, how long could a ship be kept in service compared to the age of steam and steel? Uh, quite a considerably long, longer time. In the age of steam and steel, technology advanced far too quickly. So to give an example, and it's a fairly easy one because you know, the dates are fairly well known, HMS Victory. Okay, It goes into combat at Trafalgar as one of the most capable ships present there and one of the more capable first-rate ships of the line in the world. You can make an argument there are some that are some slightly better design, but she's still certainly a top-tier combatant at Trafalgar. She's also 40 years old, and she'll go on to still be a frontline combatant for at least another half decade. Now, that's not exactly unusual. The big frontline combatants would often have careers spanning multiple decades. Some were even in service longer than victory, especially in the early part of the 17th century. Now, compare that to the Age of Steam and Steel. Um, let's take Jutland, for example. Jutland fought in 1916. So, for, to have a ship comparable to victory, you'd be talking about something like a central battery ironclad like HMS Alexandra leading the charge into Jutland. Yeah, that's not ever going to happen, is it? Um, now let's consider World War II, for example. So 1940-41, um, you know, early battles in the Mediterranean, fight against the Bismarck, that kind of thing. Well, again, 40 years, that's actually relatively easy. 1900, what have we got? mid of mid production pre dreadnoughts so we're not even talking like the the last generation really good ones like connecticut or lord nelson or danton we're talking something maybe like the london class or the 9.4 inch armed german pre dreadnoughts you know fighting against bismarck or fighting against the italians in the mediterranean uh no don't think so <laughs> so yeah Technological advancement in the age of steam and steel far, 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 far faster to the point that, you know, ships generally would have a probably a service lifespan where they were frontline top tier combatants of maybe five to ten years, if that. Bearing in mind that even Dreadnought, the HMS Dreadnought, the original Dreadnought, in service in 1906, ten years later, isn't even at the Battle of Jutland because she's not considered quite for Grand Fleet service anymore. So you're talking about five to ten years front line and maybe total lifespan 20 years barring treaties, um, if that. Whereas, yeah, in the age of sale, you could be 30, 40 years old and still be perfectly front line. You might be 50, 60 years old before people start to even worry particularly about your design. Um, and especially in a period where you might maybe be a 74 gunner, that's not even necessarily a major problem. It just means you might not fight the absolute latest and greatest but you might still be, still be in, involved in a battle with them. And that's it for this video, everybody. Thank you very much for listening. Um, there's not really any channel admin at the moment, other than obviously keeping an eye on what's going on with the world travel situation, but that all seems to be mostly under control at the moment. And so hopefully we're still on for America. Other than that, um, yeah enjoy yourselves for the rest of the day and i'll see you again in another video